On July 16, 1994, at least 21 fragments, possibly 22, of the fragmented comet uh, Shoemaker-Levy began slamming into Jupiter. And to me, it is one of the most fascinating things that has ever been seen, not only in our lifetime, but in many lifetimes. It is the most violent encounter of a heavenly body in recorded history. The first blast was estimated to be at 200,000 megatons of TNT. That's more than all of the nuclear arsenals in the world combined. It made a hole big enough to swallow up planet Earth. And Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me this fascinating encounter with Jupiter. Mm, and so it is fascinating. It uh, has several consequences, J.R. For one thing, it's kind of raised the consciousness of people to the fact that a celestial body can be bombarded by free-ranging particles in, in the universe, which is a scary thought for us on planet Earth. And for another, the time when this thing happened, that is the, the uh, spot on the calendar is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Also, the possible consequences for the weather on the planet Jupiter and subsequent uh, events that might be unfolding, perhaps even a cataclysm of sorts, um, it has, been, has caused men's imaginations to run absolutely wild. Surely we're looking at a sign in the heavens given by God himself because this has been called a once in several thousand lifetimes event. Yes, and that takes us to the Gospel of Luke chapter 21 verse 11 says, And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. In verse 25 he says, There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear, and looking after those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. War in the heavens, Gary. Fascinating oh. concept. Jesus yeah. said it would happen. Indeed. And you know, there are, uh, for example, in the news, there have been several earth-grazing asteroids that have come fairly close to planet Earth over the last few years. One is called Tutatus, named after an Anglo-Saxon uh, god of war. And it, it has come within 100,000 miles of Earth, and uh, which is, in astronomically speaking, is just an eyelash. It's a very, very uh, short distance. Reminds us of Revelation 8.8, 8, where the second angel sounds his trumpet. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. And this mountain is exactly the way you would describe an asteroid or a comet fragment. It's about the size of a mountain. Yeah. And so here in the Bible, we are, we're talking about a mountain falling. And, and you know, Gary, I heard some of the scientists actually call these comets mountains of fire mm. falling into Jupiter's wow. atmosphere. <laughs> Biblical proportions. Biblical proportions. Uh, the fascinating thing about it is this mountain of fire that's coming, according to the book of Revelation, has been on the minds of those scientists these past uh, several days and weeks in the encounter with Jupiter that has come about. And uh, I think that uh, we ought to listen to what some of the theologians have to say rather than just to what the scientists have to say. You know, they seem to have the platform, Gary, mm -hmm. and uh, nobody ask a minister, what about these comets that slammed into Jupiter, you know? No. I mean, our opinion doesn't seem to count in this world, but I want you to know that God's going to have the last word. He said there would be signs in the stars and uh, there would be great anxiety created upon the earth. Now, that doesn't mean that... Uh, that there's going to be panic necessarily. But uh, what we see with Jupiter in recent days, I think the world is going to see happen on Earth during the tribulation period. Oh. Beyond that, there are some other signs. Uh, Revelation chapter 12 talks about signs in the heavens and a war in heaven. Mm -hmm. And that brings us, I guess, to the to the idea of, of the constellations, the Revelation chapter 12. Let's talk about that, Gary. Mm. In Revelation chapter 12, John says, I see a woman in heaven, that's Virgo, clothed in the sun, the moon under her feet. She gives birth to the Messiah. 
But there is a great red dragon there, ready to devour the child as soon as it was born. And of course, this uh, launches into the following verses when it talks about Michael and his angels fighting against this dragon and his angels, and the dragon is cast out of heaven. This is a war in the heavens. Yeah. And so it has been called. By the way, uh, the sign of the Virgin in heaven, the constellation Virgo, uh, mm -hmm. literally is part of the gospel in the stars. That is, as you look along the path in the sky that is traversed by the planets, uh, it's called the ecliptic, which is a fancy word that just means a an imaginary line drawn through the stars where mm -hmm. the planets travel. And along that line, you have one of these uh, constellations, Virgo, and she is the virgin, the one who, uh, the woman who gives birth to the child. Well, biblically, that's Israel. The child, of course, is the Messiah, Jesus. And in Revelation chapter 12, we have that woman pictured perfectly. Yeah. We have, uh, she's crowned with 12 stars. She has the moon at her feet. And isn't it fascinating that d during this collision that recently happened, uh, the moon the, was at the feet oh, yeah. of, of, of the Virgin. On the night of July 16th, when these comets be, first began slamming into Jupiter, the moon was there. But let me tell you where Jupiter was. Jupiter was coming out of the feet of Virgo into the constellation Libra. And of course, just beyond Libra is Scorpio, uh, the great red dragon. Now, That's we right. picture it as a scorpion in today's uh, zodiacs, but uh, in the ancient zodiacs, it was a many-headed python. It was a, it was a many-headed dragon. Mm -hmm. And uh, Antares, the star right in the heart of Scorpio, is a red star. So here we have the great red dragon there ready to do battle. Now, in a book called The Witness of the Stars, published in 1893 by E.W. Bullinger, an Anglican minister, he talks about this constellation Libra. And here he shows Libra in uh, an ancient uh, zodiac as being not a scales as we see it today, but a lamp, a servant lamp, if you please. And he has Scorpio here ready to seize, trying to seize the serpent lamp. This is a Euphratian uh, boundary stone dating back as far as the 7th century BC. Mm -hmm. And so we have Libra here pictured not as a scales but as a lamp. And here we have Jupiter moving into this lamp as the battle begins and these 21, maybe 22 comets begin slamming into Jupiter. It, Gary, it, it, looks like, it looks like the biblical scenario of the menorah and the, and the lighting of the servant lamp, doesn't mm, it? It really does. And what we have here, of course, uh, it's called the gospel in the stars. Mm -hmm. It's called essentially, what it is is a giant pantheon. It's a, a, a play that takes place in the heavens. And the idea is that the heavens declare the glory of God. That is his redemption. The whole pattern of the, the, the virgin, the child, the redeemer being born up, defeating Satan. And we have that in Revelation 12 where we have uh, the woman in Revelation 12, 1, a woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now, it's kind of fascinating to me, J.R. This is the language of the Great Tribulation. That is, mm -hmm. a, a woman laboring to give birth is the classic picture of the Tribulation. Yes. And can we ask the question, you know, could these sights and signs in the heavens be a clue to those of us who believe, looking up there, yeah. that perhaps the travail of the woman, uh, that is Israel, <laughs> Now, you know, Gary, it, it, it seems to me that this, this idea of the moon being under the feet of Virgo yeah. at the time when these comets began slamming into Jupiter right. looks like the commencement of the final battle between Christ and Antichrist, between, between shall we say, Michael and Lucifer, and that's the angels of heaven yeah. against the angels of hell. This is a picture that's given in the 12th chapter of Revelation. We're not making anything up. It's in, mm -hmm. in plain black and white. She has the moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of 12 stars. She is uh, being with child. She's crying. She's travailing in birth. This is today's Israel. And yeah. we have the servant lamp. Now, go into that for a minute because Jupiter 
the largest of the planets, uh -huh. is a kind of a servant lamp planet. Yes. But you, you, you see these servant lamps behind me, or the, the menorah behind me. This is a seven lamp menorah. But of course, the Hanukkah menorah is a nine lamp menorah. And the center lamp, the one you see right over my head there, uh, represents the servant lamp, or the one from which the others get its light. The fascinating thing about Jupiter is that it is the middle lamp of nine planets. Mm -hmm. It is the middle planet of nine planets. A nice, neat Hanukkah menorah and Jupiter being the servant lamp. Well, it looks like Satan, the, the uh, Lucifer, you know, is the light bearer. That's what mm. the name means. But he has no light of his own. He's trying to seize the serpent lamp. And mm -hmm. that's what we see in uh, Bullinger's ancient yeah, uh, uh, gospel in the stars. This is God's message of redemption written in the heavens. Now, as always, Satan has his counterfeit. Yeah. There's always the opposing view, and, and the secular view of Jupiter is kind of fascinating. In fact, uh, we've, we have, uh, J.R. has beside him a mm -hmm. couple of novels by Arthur Clarke. Yeah. And Arthur Clarke is, is kind of the patron uh, saint of space travel in our era. He mm -hmm. was a mathematician, he was a theorist who developed the idea of the satellite and global satellite communication and wrote many science fiction novels, but we're interested in a couple because they really deal with the planet Jupiter yeah. uh, as a servant lamp. That's right. Arthur Clarke not only is, an, is a fiction writer, but it is said that he invented the communication satellite back in 1945, which of course has finally come to fruition. He wrote a trilogy of books. 2001, A Space Odyssey was made into a movie. His second book, 2010, Odyssey 2, was also made into a movie. And his third book, 2061, has not yet been made into a movie, Odyssey 3. Now, the, the storyline of these three books and of the movie is that the planet Jupiter is ignited and becomes a second sun. We have a clip from the movie, 2010 to show you uh, where Jupiter explodes and becomes this second sun in the sky. Now in the storyline, an alien presence ignites the planet Jupiter and it explodes. Yeah, they Incredible. do this by covering it with a, a black coating and it causes it to implode uh, and when it does, it explodes outward and becomes a new sun. Uh -huh. uh, a tremendous shock wave. Now, you know, fascinating that this, this should do this in, in a movie or in a fiction book. It, it, it certainly points up the, uh, the euphoria that was being experienced mm. by the scientists in, this, in these days. And now we see closing scenes here of two suns in the sky over yeah. Earth. I think here's yeah. London. Uh, this would be Moscow. Oh, the Moscow. first one was uh, the United States. And this one is most incredible ah. over the Pyramid of Giza yeah. in, in uh, Egypt. Why the Pyramid of Giza? Fascinating scene there, isn't it? Really is. According to Arthur C. Clarke, this sun, this second sun, lasts for a thousand years. In his book 2061, he has this second sun, called, uh, once called Jupiter, to fade in the year 3001. Fascinating thing that is that on page 13, of his book, 2061, Odyssey 3, he writes that the new name of this star is no longer Jupiter. It has been renamed Lucifer. Fascinating, Gary. Mm. How much truth and how much fiction is there? Well, J.R., as with all things symbolic and metaphorical, uh, you, it makes you wonder because if Jupiter is the servant lamp planet, and if there is a battle in the heavens to seize control, then Jupiter becomes the focus of the battle. As a matter of fact, uh, the constellation of the Scorpion, you know, mm -hmm. seizing and grasping to try to hold, get hold of the servant lamp yes. is the very thing that is pictured in these novels by Arthur Clarke, in yes. which uh, Jupiter suddenly becomes Lucifer. Uh, what can you say? <laughs> amazing. What's so amazing <laughs> is these comets began slamming into Jupiter when it was in the servant lamp Libra. Exactly. And by the way, what date did they begin to fall? Oh, yeah. The ninth of Av. That's what's so incredible about it, isn't it? It is. The ninth of Av, historically in the Jewish calendar, that would be uh, the evening of the 16th. At sundown, the 16th began the ninth of Av in the Jewish calendar.
And we had had one comet fragment slam uh, into Jupiter and were awaiting the second and the That's third right. and the so on. And there were four that slammed into Jupiter on the 9th of Av, which was yeah. Saturday night through Sunday evening. And uh, the ninth of Av, Gary, historically has been a real downer for Israel. That's the date upon which both the temples were destroyed, the, the date in which the, the spies gave an evil report mm -hmm. uh, uh, when they went into the land to spy it out. Uh, it's, it's been a, uh, shall we call it, a date of calamity for Israel. Yes, and I think it's related to Jacob's trouble as well. Yes, indeed now, it is. The fascinating thing is, with all of these things happening in connection with the prophecies in the Bible, do we have indeed a sign in the heavens that is telling us that the tribulation period is about to commence? Mm. This war between Christ and Antichrist? This battle between Michael and Lucifer mm -hmm. sure sounds like the possibility, doesn't it, Gary? Yeah, and to speak about another aspect of that battle, you recently had a conversation with a gentleman by the name of William Cooper, a, a man who is credentialed, who has mm -hmm. been in the service of his country for many years, and, and he told you a story yeah. that I think would be do well to pass along right about here. Between 1970 and 1973, he worked for Naval Intelligence in the office of the commander of the Pacific Fleet. And he said that during that time he worked on Operation Majority and uh, the formulation of the plans under Operation Majority was that the world would establish a world government under the United Nations. A part of this was a project called Project Galileo wherein they suggested sending five pounds of plutonium to the planet Jupiter and ignite the planet for you see, Jupiter is, is made up of helium, 90% helium and 10%, uh, or excuse me, 90% hydrogen, 10% mm -hmm. helium, the same composition as our sun. That's right. In fact, some have called Jupiter a failed star, mm -hmm. too large to be a planet, too small to be a sun. But all, all it takes, say the scientists, would be just a little bit of a nuclear reaction to start a chain reaction in the hydrogen mm -hmm. and to turn the planet into a sun that would burn for maybe a thousand years. So you're saying that not only is there a science fiction element to this thing, but, but NASA may actually have considered turning Jupiter into a sun. Perhaps why? Yeah. I mean, to give us more warmth? Uh... Well, according to Project Majority, there were a number of reasons. One was to give a little bit of added warmth to the world so as to ward off any future ice age. Hmm. Which sounds rather ridiculous. It does. Sounds like some mad scientist in charge of this thing. <laughs> yes. Now, the project was called Project Galileo, where they would send five pounds of plutonium. But the truth of the matter is, in June of 1989, Project Galileo got off the ground. Yeah. A space probe was launched for Jupiter called Galileo, and they have not five pounds of plutonium on board, but 49.7 pounds of plutonium. In December of 1995, just next year, uh, Galileo is going to begin to orbit Jupiter mm -hmm. as it arrives at the planet. And uh, the suspicion is, and the scuttlebutt is, that it will, its orbit will deteriorate in late 1999, just in time to fall into the planet and ignite the planet by New Year's Eve 1999 to welcome in the year 2000 mm -hmm. and the millennium that will belong to Lucifer, according to Arthur Clarke. <laughs> but according to the yeah. Bible, it's going to belong to Jesus Christ. He's going to rule for a thousand years, not Lucifer. Wow. <laughs> Symbolically, then, there really is this battle in the heavens that we see in Revelation 12. Uh, it, <clears throat> there's a battle between the God's creation mm -hmm. and the men of earth who want to modify creation, hopefully to make it more suitable to their needs and their causes. So yes. really and truly there is a battle in which Jupiter is kind of the centerpiece. So do you suppose God is uh, really? deliberately allowing this train of comets to plow into Jupiter as a kind of message, something we should be looking at in this day? Well, the message to me, after it could not light the servant lamp, it yeah. did not turn Jupiter into a sun with all of this kinetic energy, could 49 pounds of plutonium do the job? I think not. I don't find anything in the prophecies of the Bible about there being two suns in the sky. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I, I read about darkness over the earth and, 
And yes. uh, I read about the sun turning as black as sackcloth of ashes and the moon turning as blood. That is losing its, mm -hmm. its brilliance. So uh, I see that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to win out over this thing. Fascinating thing about this new world order that they're going to uh, have a gala celebration on uh, New Year's Eve 1999 to welcome in the new millennium. Uh, even President George Bush, past President George Bush, said that he would be at the Pyramid of Giza on New Year's Eve night for the big gala celebration to welcome in this new era of a new world order and what Arthur Clarke has called uh, the Millennium of Lucifer. Wow. Now, we, in closing, we've got a couple minutes here. Uh, the Jews, uh, Jewish uh, observant Jews today who are living in the expectation of the coming of Messiah, Mm -hmm. uh, have a view of this whole event. In fact, uh, Lubavitcher Jews have a particular way of looking at what has just happened to Jupiter. And I think this is very interesting. We recently heard a tape from a Rabbi Zalman Weisberg, and he was talking about Midrashic thoughts on Jupiter. He delivered a lecture June 19th, 1994. Uh, a week after the death of Menachem Schneerson. And as you know, they're thinking Menachem Schneerson might possibly even be resurrected to be their Messiah. Well, mm -hmm. be that as it may. He's talking about many things in this tape. The Battle of Gog and Magog. The climactic events which will bring Messiah. The fact that Messiah Ben David will soon come to free uh, the uh, Jews from their shackles, establish the Messianic Kingdom. But his opinion of Jupiter is that the comet fragments attacking Jupiter uh, are the devil trying to prevent the arrival of Messiah. And yeah. he said something very interesting, J.R., namely that Jupiter was the king planet and the yeah. symbol of the Messiah. A symbol of the Messiah. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Incredible. We, we see it as a servant lamp. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, it's one and the same thing. When you open the Revelation chapter 1, you see Jesus standing in the middle of a menorah. He is the servant lamp of the menorah, and his countenance is as the sun shineth in its strength. So when we have these comets plowing into Jupiter, this, this lighting of the servant lamp, so to speak, have we now arrived at the beginning of the 22 chapters of Revelation as these 22 comets plow into Jupiter? Are we opening chapter 1 at this time? Have we come out of the pages of the Bible onto reality? Is the tribulation period about to begin? Good question.